Good morning to our live streaming from Church on the Rise this morning, where you find yourself in your dining rooms or in your, in your lounges. We want to welcome you on behalf of our leadership, and we want to say on this fifth Sunday of April 2020, as we celebrate in Palm Sunday, that God would bless you. I want to start off just by reading a passage out of Psalm 2, verse 7 and 8, and it says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the possession and the ends of the earth for your possession. Just bow our heads and we open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you to each one that is, that is tuned in right now. And we pray that wherever they find that you will bless them, that you will open up their ears of understanding. And Lord, that your spirit will meet them in a very special way. Thank you for this time together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to speak to you about the topic, The King is Coming. And as we are celebrating Palm Sunday, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 12 to 15. The word says, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast. And when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's cart. I wonder if there's a few things that stand out here. And the one thing I want to speak to you about is that Jesus is referred to as the son of David. Now, today Christians around the world celebrate Palm Sunday, the Sunday before the Passover weekend, because almost 2,000 years ago, on a same Sunday like this in the year 30 AD, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the holy city, on a young donkey, a colt, to celebrate Passover with his disciples. The people heard he was coming and they went out to meet him with their branches of palm trees and the shouts of joy because they had heard him for three years ministering, healing the sick, raising the dead. And now they had heard that he's coming and they placed their hope in Jesus to do something specially for them as he can do for you this morning. You see, the name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. God or Yahweh is salvation. God is salvation. And they believed that the Messiah would overthrow the Roman oppressors and restore the kingdom to Israel. And they would be liberated, set free. To which Gospels, Matthew's Gospel affirms this in Matthew 21, verse 8 and, 8 and 9 says, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the roads. Others cut down branches on the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before them and those who followed the crying Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You see, the son of David 
was a title referred to as Yeshua HaMashiach, the Anointed One, the Christos, the Christ. The Gospel refers to, to Jesus as the Son of David and as the Son of Abraham, indicating His royal origin directly from the line of David, but also Him being a true Son of Israel from the line of Abraham, to whom the promise is referred to by God. We read in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 14, it says, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you. We will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. You shall build a house for my name and I will establish of his, a throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. You see, he's referring to Jesus. Now when we read the parables and we read the gospels, we have a greater understanding when Jesus is referred to as the son of David. We read, understand why the people, the mob, the crowd, tried to silence blind Bartimaeus when Jesus was coming through Jerusalem and he was exiting Jerusalem. It was not because he was blind. It was not because he was begging. It was not because he was shouting. But it was because to whom he was referring. He referred to Jesus as the Messiah. And we read that in Mark 10, 46. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 46 to 48. You see, in Jesus, we have received a Savior whom we acknowledge as the Son of God. And the Apostle Paul assures us of this promise and we give hope to others that whoever calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. Romans 10, 13, Paul says, whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. Secondly, not only his title, but the shouts of victory that the people were crying out. You see, in ancient Middle Eastern times, the palm branch was a symbol of victory. It was a symbol of triumph, of peace, but also a symbol of eternal life. And a palm branch was awarded to the victorious athletes in ancient Olympic Games, in the Greek Games. But in ancient Rome, the palm tree personified victory and is often depicted on the coins and on their buildings. The people wave palm branches, which symbolize the goodness of God, and their soon coming victory they were expecting through Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, the righteous one. We read in Psalm 92, where it says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, meaning a cedar tree grows tall, and he's referring to those who are righteous shall flourish. But the early Christians also used the palm branch to symbolize the victory of the faithful over the enemies of their soul. And it's evidenced by the ancient art, the art that we find. We see pictures of Jesus sitting among palm trees in heaven. More importantly, it was common practice in the ancient world to welcome home a king or a hero. You've all seen the movie Gladiator. You've all seen when the king, when the emperor returns and he comes down the streets of Rome and how the people are throwing things down. It was a way of welcoming a king or a euro by laying out the path of branches for him to ride or walk on. And the Romans too, they honored their champions of the games with their military and their military with palm branches. Today, we might say that we roll out a red carpet of someone of significance. I want to just share a little bit with you when we think of who Jesus is in all of this. In Leviticus chapter 23, we, we, we read about the feasts of God, not the feasts of Israel, but the feasts of the Lord. You see, all the feasts pointed to Jesus. See, he is the true hero. He is the one that is welcomed as he comes down the streets, coming entry into the streets of Jerusalem. You see, the, the various feasts that were celebrated was the Sabbath because he is our rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all that are burdened and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He is the Passover lamb. He is the unleavened bread, the bread of life, the grain of wheat that fell into the ground that died. And because he down, dry, died, now there is a harvest that comes forth. He is the feast of first fruits because he is the resurrection and the life, as he says to Martha and Mary in John chapter 11. He is also in the Feast of Weeks, or what we refer to as Pentecost. He's the Lord of the harvest 
because Pentecost was a harvest festival which symbolized the beginning of the barley and the begin the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. And Jesus sends out his disciples to go into the world to gather into the harvest. He is the feast of trumpets because at the final trumpet, Jesus will sound and will bring all things that was culminated to this point will come to an end. He is the day of atonement because he is the high priest on the day of ascension that entered into the highest heavens and forever interceded on my behalf and your behalf as our high priest. He is also in the feast of tabernacles because he is God's tabernacle. He is God's dwelling place. And from that place where he ascended in, he pours out God's presence, the Holy Spirit, into our lives. Joel chapter 2 verse 28. And we read about the feast in Leviticus chapter 23. But it's specifically 23 verse 40 referring to the feast of tabernacles. It says, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of the beautiful trees, the branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and the willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israel shall dwell in booths that your generations, it says that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You see, the palm branches were used to rejoice and the people waved the palm branches because they were expecting victory through Jesus Christ, their Messiah, who would deliver them from their Roman oppressors as God used Moses to deliver them out of Egypt 1,500 years earlier. You see, the word of Zana that was shouting means save now. They were crying out to Jesus, save us from these oppressors, save us from our circumstances. But God's salvation was different to what they expected because victory to, to them, victory to God meant that he would send his son, the Messiah, to lay down his life for them and for you and me because Jesus came to offer God's salvation of receiving mercy and grace. And what is mercy? Mercy is not receiving the punishment that we rightly deserve because of our sins. Can I say that again? Mercy is not receiving the punishment which we rightly deserve because of our sins. But grace is receiving the divine favor of God and his blessings, which we are so undeserved of. We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us. And Romans 5 verse 10 to 11 says, For when, he, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Through Jesus laying down his life, we can have shouts of joy and victory because we have been reconciled to God. But not only that, in coming, Jesus was the symbol of peace. You see, Jesus rode on a colt of a donkey, Fulfilling the prophecy in scripture of Zechariah verse 9. It says, Rejoice, ye, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, Jesus rode on a donkey because it was a symbol of peace. As opposed to Riding on a horse that we see often mentioned where kings came into battle, they rode on horses declaring war. But the donkey was used for peace and for the purpose of work. Jesus showed that he came to do his father's work. And that his work was not yet complete, but would only be finished a week later when he would cry out from the cross these words, Tetalestai, it is finished. The price has been paid. In the ancient world, a leader rode on the horse. He was coming in war. But a donkey to signify peace. Jesus did not come to declare war, but to offer peace without the shedding of anyone's blood, except the blood of his own, in which he gave us a ransom for our sins and as an offering to God so that we may receive God's pardon for our sins. Because really we were criminals deserving 
of death. Jesus used the donkey to identify with the people. Then and now, we experience being oppressed. We experience going through difficult times. And in doing so, he made a statement that in the choice of a donkey, instead of a horse, it was God's way of saying that he came as a king, not to rule over, but to serve his people and to save them from their sins. You see, they expected a military and a political era as many people have put their hope and trust in governments and politicians and in militant personalities. But Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. Colossians 1, verse 19, 19 to 20 says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, by him to reconcile all things to himself. Whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace, can I say that again? Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus is the Prince of Peace who gives peace which surpasses, which transcends, which is beyond any human understanding, even beyond our own reasoning. We do not make sense. It doesn't make sense when we are faced, even in this lockdown, but we are guaranteed and can experience his peace as opposed to being in turmoil, turmoil or anxiety. In Matthew 21, verse 2 to 3, it says, Jesus sent two disciples saying, Go into the village opposite and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need. And immediately he will send them. You see, Jesus finished his work, but our work is yet incomplete. We've been called to go into all the world. The Great Commission, the last instruction that our Lord, our King gave to us to go into all the world with the gospel, the good news, not a word of condemnation, but one of peace, one of reconciliation. The word of God says in 2 Corinthians that we are ambassadors of Christ recon reconciling the world to God. Reaching out to every person. And the question is, are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to be that donkey or that cult? that is loosened, that is set free, so that Jesus may ride upon you, that not you will receive the glory, but as actually the one who sits on the donkey that is receiving the glory because of the work that's being achieved. Are you willing to be set free and say, Lord, here I am, use me to complete the work that you have called me to do? In closing, I want to close off and say, behold, I come quickly. In Revelation 22, 12, Jesus is speaking. He says, and behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. You see, the king is coming. But the question is, are you ready to receive your king? Are you ready to receive the king of kings? Time does not permit me to discuss God's timeline with you today. But God has allowed this COVID-19 or coronavirus to, in order to force his people to enter into their homes and get ready. As Noah entered into the ark with his family, so you are in your homes with your loved ones and are given the opportunity to draw near, to evaluate, to make yourself prepared and ready to receive your king. There's currently no entertainment, no sport, no pubs, have you ever heard of this, except in the Great Awakening that took place in Wales over a hundred years ago, where the people ran off the soccer fields and out of the pubs and came on their knees crying out to God for salvation? While there's no sport, no entertainment, there's no bar pubs or bars or clubs or restaurants open because in order to arrest the attention of the church, God has shut them all down. Everything of the world to get the church out of the world which has held them busy and preoccupied them in these times in a place of captivity. You know, as Moses led them out of Egypt, God has taken us out of the world, but we are not yet in the promised land. They had to wait before as they came out to enter in. We are waiting to enter in as Christ returns. 
You see, in 2018, on the 14th of May, Israel celebrated their 70th birthday as a nation. After many, almost 2,000 years, not having a country of their own, not even having a language, God has restored the people to Israel. He's restored them as a nation. He's restored their language. And they keep on coming back and making Aliyah, returning to Israel. And this was a signal that the time of the church age is coming to an end. And the time on Israel's clock will soon begin to count down to usher in the final seven years, the time of Jacob's trouble. I will speak about that next week. Ephesians 5 verse 25 to 27 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? The word says he gave himself for her, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And you can think of a bride getting ready for a wedding day. She's not going to get her white dress dirty, soiled. She's going to make sure that everything is in place. The church is the bride. And God has given us time to enter into our homes, to prepare, to get ready. I want to ask you that where you're sitting in your, in, in your houses, have you clothed yourself with the garment of righteousness? Is there oil in your lamp? Have you made and used the time to forgive others and ask others to forgive you? Time to make right with others, time to make right with God. You see, time does not permit me, but I will be speaking about it next week with the gathering of the saints. You see, people don't see it in scripture. We speak about the second coming, but before the second coming, there's a word in scripture that speaks of the harpatsu, the gathering away, the taking out. When Jesus comes and he fetches his bride. And many of you might have watched the movie a few years ago of Left Behind with Nicolas Cage, which was so important because God was using that to prepare the world for what is coming. He's coming to take his bride. The light and salt is taking out of this world. At his first coming, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, declaring God's favor and peace. But 2,000 years later, Jesus will return on a white horse and his second coming declaring war. And we read that in Revelations 22, 11 and 30 says, Now I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one except him himself could understand. He was clothed in robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God. Jesus, God that became the Word that became flesh. When Jesus returns, he will set up his earthly kingdom and reign from Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And the Word of God says, Every knee shall bow and proclaim him. The kings of the earth. The presidents and rulers, all that have opposed him, will bow and worship him. Because this is what God intended from the very beginning. I want to, as I finish off, when Moses arrived at Mount Sinai, as they came out of Egypt, he came to Mount Sinai and God called Moses up and God gave Moses three things. He gave him the law, the Ten Commandments. He gave him the feasts that they would celebrate and he gave them the tabernacle, the pattern of the tabernacle, which lately, later on became the temple, the dwelling place. You see, in Jesus, he is our law, the Lord, our righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be, us, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He is Everything that the feast speak about, because the feast was, the Jewish word was a mohed. It was a holy convocation. It was preparing them of how to worship. And he is the object of our worship. <clears throat> Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says, So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival or a feast or a new moon or a Sabbath which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ who has come. He is the object of our worship. He gave them the tabernacle. 
He is God's dwelling. A tabernacle word, tabernacle means to dwell. He is the dwelling place of God. In John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. You see, when Jesus was saying that, what he was actually saying, the, the gate coming in to the temple was called the way. The door into the holy place was called the truth. The veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was called the life. And only the high priest could enter. And when he was crucified, the curtain, the veil was torn that we have access into the presence of God. No longer going through a priest, no longer going through anyone, but going through Christ, our mediator of a new covenant. Colossians 2 says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is God's tabernacle. And that's why the scripture says, In him we dwell and have our being. Who is Jesus to you? Because if you see him for who he is, your life will never be the same. As my life was changed almost 30 years ago, your life will never be the same. Everything you will forsake because of him. Paul says it as, he says, I was a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He says, I count this all as, and he uses the word, as rubbish. But to know him and the power of his resurrection. Who is Jesus to you? Are you prepared to forsake everything? In Matthew 21, 8 says, the, the multitude, they spread their clothes on the road. And the act of spreading palm branches and clothes are of great significance. Because with Jesus Christ's triumphal entry 2,000 years ago on this very Palm Sunday into Jerusalem, the people, by showing, by waving the palm branches, by spreading it on the ground, by putting their clothes, they were not only showing respect and honor, but more importantly, by spreading their clothes, it was an act of submission paid to royalty they acknowledged as a king. The only passage that we have in scripture refers to in 2 Kings verse nine, chapter 9, verse 13, King Jeho, and he wasn't a very good king, but it says that each man hastened to take his garment and put it under him on the top of the steps. And they blew trumpets saying, Jehu is king. How much more Jesus, when we put everything that we have at his feet and lay it before him and say, Lord, here I am. He name me. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. In closing, when he returns, will he be your king or will he be your judge? You can at this moment make him the king of your life by seeing and receiving him for who he really is, believing who he is and what he has done for you. He came 2,000 years on a donkey. He's returning on a white horse. Just bow your heads with me for a moment and let's pray. And I want you, if you're able to pray this prayer, reach out, lift your hands, and we will pray the prayer of salvation. Heavenly Father, thank you that I can come to you this morning as a sinner. And as I shouted the words of Zana, I'm shouting saying, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner deserving of death, but I put my hope and my trust in what Jesus has done for me. And I receive him as my king, as my Lord, and as my savior. Forgive me my sins. Deliver me from all my sins and my iniquities and my transgressions and wash me in the blood of Jesus. I ask this, Lord, right now, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Shalom.
We want to thank you for joining us this morning. And I pray God's blessing over you and your families, his protection, his provision. And if you've done and you've did the sinner's prayer with, with me this morning, I want to encourage you to contact your, uh, near, your nearest church or church that is a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church and that they can follow up with you. But at the same time, if you want to contact us, our numbers will be at the bottom of the screen. And I look forward to you joining again with us next week as we meet next week on Resurrection Sunday that you join with us. And it's a wonderful opportunity. Invite your friends to join us. We will send the link. May God richly bless you. Shalom.
Here's our love tonight. Here's our time tonight, our energy, our affection. 